How's it going everyone? It's Chow here again and today we are going to talk about DNA replication. So let's get started. Alright, so this topic I honestly don't know how to teach anymore because I've done it way too many times and it's actually quite difficult to get the hang of it so I'm going to go over sort of the basics and the gists but I think it's very useful if you go actually read your textbook or um, go online and look up uh, animations. There are some great animations online showing you sort of the individual components and then how different bases are added, etc, etc. So I think that will be very useful. But for the sake of time, I will go over some of the brief information that might potentially be helpful. So if we look at the short version over here, DNA replication, our goal really is just to duplicate that DNA molecule. So in order to do that, we have to separate that double helix. So when you separate the double helix, you end up with two template strands. And then of course, you have to add nucleotides to form these complementary base pairings to those template strands. And then of course, ultimately form phosphodiester bonds to make sure the DNA is nice and stable and there aren't any broken strands on your nucleic acid. So there you go, the short version. Now, if we go to the long version, it gets a little bit tricky, and we have to look at a couple of things. So, what's really key about DNA replication is that you actually have to form sort of these complexes before you can actually start the whole process of this idea of replication. So, you have this location called the origin of replication, also known as the ORI, or the ORI, and this particular area over here requires a pre-replication complex. So you have a small sequence of DNA that's recognized by a complex of proteins um, called the pre-replication complex. And this is actually where sort of the process of replication actually begins. Now, what's really fascinating perhaps is that um, oftentimes in uh, prokaryotes, for instance, in bacteria, their genome is in a circular sort of uh, strand. So, so they're basically their entire genome is in a circle. What that means is that you can basically start at one point and work around the circle and you can finish replicating the entirety of the genome. Now, like if you look at it right here, you can see that if you start in one place, you can just start branching out and branching out and going in opposite directions until eventually the ends kind of just meet up and you replicated the entire genome. Now in eukaryotes, however, that actually doesn't really work out too well because it's a long strand. So in eukaryotes, the um, again, remember, if you think about chromosomes, for instance, you have multiple chromosomes. So the strands of DNA are often in a linear shape that's often coiled up, but you have to like uncoil it a little bit uh, in order to have um, the proteins gain access to them, and that's a completely... Uh, annoying piece of information that's probably best saved for another time. But eukaryotes typically have several uh, origins of replications because they actually have a linear DNA. So it ends up looking more like this and then they go in opposite directions and hopefully at the end they all meet up and then you get the, uh, the genome to be duplicated. So uh, prokaryotes start in one spot oftentimes and eukaryotes start in multiple spots. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, when you look at the actual replication area itself, you have this bubble that forms after the complex starts replicating and pushing away. And so DNA is basically unwound, forming that bubble, which is over here, and two replication forks, which are these things over here. And at the replication fork, the two strands of DNA are actually unwound in opposite directions, which kind of makes sense, so they're, they're going in opposite directions. And what's really fascinating is that there are two replication forks because the replication is moving bidirectionally in opposite directions. So you have one complex that's going this way, and then another complex that's going this way. Same goes for this one, and same goes for that one, same goes for this one, same goes for that one. So you have multiple origins or replication that form multiple 
replication bubbles, right? And then those bubbles form multiple replication forks, and the complexes of enzymes that help replicate the DNA are going in opposite directions. And then the whole idea is eventually you have an area where they just kind of meet up and you have the entire section of DNA or the entire genome or that entire chromosome or that entire strand of DNA ultimately fully replicated. So this is very important because, yeah, it's very important just because, um, but no, the DNA synthesis in, um, in organisms always go from a five prime to three prime direction. Notice we're talking about synthesis. So in terms of synthesis, DNA, uh, DNA synthesis occurs from the five prime to three prime direction. But when you're reading the template strand, the, it's being read in a three prime to five prime direction. So remember the, the strands are anti-parallel, right? So when they're anti-parallel, if the template strand is being read at a three prime to five prime direction, the new strand can be synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. So that's important to keep in your mind. Now here's a whole bunch of text that's kind of perhaps a little intimidating, but um, it, it's potentially useful for you. So I wrote everything down. So because the synthesis must occur in the five prime to three prime direction, what's really fascinating is that you actually can run into some problems with one of the strands. And so if you're running the replication fork from here to here, for instance, or going from uh, right to left in this direction, one of those strands is being read from a three prime to five prime direction. So this bottom strand is being read from a three prime to five prime direction. And this is good because then you can have continuous synthesis in the five prime to three prime direction. However, the other strand that can't happen because you're actually running from the five prime to three prime direction while it's being read, that's not good. So what actually happens is this strand over here is synthesized in segments. Um, and because the two strands are being synthesized differently, this strand down here that's continuous is being called the lagging or the leading strand, excuse me. So the continuous strand is the leading strand, whereas the non-continuous strand over here is the lagging strand. So continuous is leading, non-continuous is lagging. So what's really fascinating is that because the template strand is running in the five prime to three prime direction in the lagging strand, there's actually kind of a, a little bit of a twist that occurs that allows it to be synthesized in segments. So it's still being read in the three prime to five prime direction, but that twist causes the DNA replication to not be continuous. So it acts as kind of like a, what they call a trombone model where a part of the DNA loops out and is replicated. And then it has to, uh, like the, the the complex literally has to detach itself and reattach and so that's why you get these segments over here and each of these segments are called okazaki fragments so there you go now if we backtrack just a little bit in order to allow for dna replication to actually start you need to have an rna primer so you can think about DNA polymerase, which is uh, DNA P3. That's the, the major workhorse uh, in prokaryotes for replicating the majority of the genome. But DNA polymerase 3, and actually pretty much DNA polymerase in general, it's not exactly the brightest of enzymes. So it actually needs something to prime it. And in order to prime it, you use a primase. So a primase is this uh, particular enzyme that adds a primer, which is a short RNA sequence, and then it primes the DNA polymerase to actually begin adding nucleotides on there. And I'll show you a picture, I think, in a bit. But when you look at it this way, you can think about how in order for DNA replication to occur, you actually need RNA to be bound there as well. So the DNA polymerase 3 begins adding nucleotides once the primer is set. The nucleotides are generally brought over by um, deoxynucleotide triphosphates, or DNTPs, and the breaking of the phosphate groups drives the formation of the phosphodiester bond. So you actually have this, um, you actually break off two phosphates, um, and this is called pyrophosphate. So the two phosphates that remain uh, actually are also hydrolyzed, and this is very energetically favorable, which drives the formation of the phosphodiester bond.
Um, you don't need, generally you don't need to know the mechanisms of what exactly happens, but um, just know that you actually use a DNTP, a deoxynucleotide triphosphate, and then you remove two of the phosphates and then you connect it to the ever-growing strand. And then this happens for a while, and so DNA polymerase continues to just add in more and more nucleotides until it either reaches A, the end of maybe the leading strand, or B, uh, it reaches the primer of uh, the lagging strand. So remember, when you have uh, replication, right, in this instance, one side is the leading strand, the other side is the lagging strand, and then eventually when the two bubbles end up connecting, you're gonna start hitting another primer, and that's when DNA polymerase three just kind of stops. Then once that's set, you have another DNA polymerase in prokaryotes called DNA polymerase one right here that ends up going in and degrading the primer and replacing it with uh, an actual DNA base. So remember that those primers are RNA, so you want to get rid of that and actually turn it back into DNA. So DNA polymerase one usually is that enzyme that goes through and does those replacing. Obviously, DNA polymerase 3 and DNA polymerase 1 have their own special abilities to kind of fix incorrectly paired bases, but that's a little bit of a discussion uh, for another time. And then the last thing that we have to keep in mind is that when you form those base pairings, it's actually more of just a sort of just the hydrogen bond itself that's holding it together. What DNA polymerase 1 doesn't really do a good job of is it really doesn't actually form any of those phosphodiester linkages. So you need another enzyme called DNA ligase to come in afterwards and actually form the phosphodiester bonds between the fragments. So you need a whole host, a whole suite of um, different enzymes in order for the uh, replication to be successful. So there you go. Now, when you look at these complexes, there are also other enzymes within the mix. And I'll show you a photo in the, in the very end that should tie everything together. But if you look at the replication enzymes, there are also other types of enzymes in the mix as well. So the first one that we often talk about is um, DNA helicase. So helicase actually unwinds the DNA using ATP and it basically breaks down some of the, um, it, it doesn't necessarily unwind it in, in the natural sense, but it, it, it unzips it, maybe is a better word. So maybe we should uh, change that to saying uh, un unzips the double bond using, uh, uh, using some kind of a, an ATP hydrolysis. And so it unzips that double strand into single strand components by breaking the hydrogen bonds. And in the process, it kind of unwinds it in a way. But what, it ha what, what basically it can cause though is it can create knots as well as single-stranded DNA. So that's going to be problems that you have to fix. Now, other things that you have to deal with are of course actually replicating right the DNA itself. So that's uh, going to be using DNA polymerase, which is um, a type of enzyme that requires a, f a primer. It's a family of them, and it's what's doing the majority of the replication itself. And then again, primase is the one that synthesizes the, the, the primer. Now, cool. Now remember, in this case, we have one problem that occurs, and that is you know, single-stranded DNA is very susceptible to degradation, and it's very, it really wants to sort of reform that double helix. So it really wants to come back together with the other strand. In order to allow it to be stable and to prevent it from degradation uh, and, and make it not go back together and recoil, you use these proteins called single-stranded binding proteins that end up binding to the DNA strands to keep them from rebinding with each other. So that's pretty important. Now, there are other issues too. So if you look at this problem over here, we talked about how when you have a DNA helicase that's just kind of unzipping the DNA helix, you're going to be creating these knots. Now, as the knots get tighter and tighter and you're pushing on and on with the complex, you need to basically sort of relax those coils. Now, there are a couple ways you can relax those coils, but one particular enzyme does a great job of that, and it's topoisomerase. So topoisomerase is this donut-shaped enzyme that kind of surrounds a single strand of DNA and removes knots. 
There are kind of two different types of topo isomerases. One of them makes like single-stranded nicks, whereas another type makes sort of double-stranded nicks. And depending on how the strand is being oriented, it basically, bottom line, uh, sort of surrounds that strand that's being pulled and then it ultimately removes the knot. So it, it releases the tension in the replication. So there you go. The other part of the story lies in the sliding DNA clamp, and the clamp actually stabilizes, so it helps ma maintain that replication complex, and it stabilizes the DNA and polymerase complex, and it ultimately increases efficiency. So we finally get to the image right here, and we can see that here you have your DNA polymerase, so this is just kind of the totality of everything I talked about. And again, you might want to check out an animation on the interwebs that might be very, very useful in describing the details more. But let's say that here you have a sort of DNA polymerase. Um, here is your helicase over here that's going to be breaking apart those hydrogen bonds. And then here's your primase, which is just putting down those uh, RNA primers. Here you have topoisomerase in the front, and then it's just trying to unwind those strands by preventing more knots from being formed. And then over here, you have your, um, your sliding clamp over here that's going to help stabilize your complex. You actually have a clamp loader on there as well, which is the other part of the story, which can help load the clamp onto there. And then, of course, over here, this is the lagging strand, right? Because it has to be replicated in sort of an opposite direction. So this is the loop that I was talking about earlier, where basically it's being read still in the lagging strand from the three prime to five prime direction, but there's a loop that occurs. So what happens is that it kind of forces the lagging strand to replicate the DNA in a sort of sectional sequence called Okazaki. So those are, are basically eventually Okazaki fragments that have to be stitched together. And after replicating for a certain number of bases, like usually a thousand bases, it actually just kind of unhooks and like reanimates itself. It's very hard to describe, so this is why an animation is very useful. But um, in order to again keep everything stable, you use single-stranded binding proteins to maintain that stability. So that's basically the general gist of uh, the whole concept of DNA replication. Uh, just a brief mention, you have telomeres. So telomeres are actually found at the ends of eukaryotic DNA. And remember, eukaryotic DNA is basically uh, linear, so it's one single strand. And you have ends over here that can get, get a little bit complicated when it comes to replication because you actually don't have primers there. So in order to prevent your DNA from getting shorter and shorter, you use a telomerase to basically lengthen the telomeric components. And the tel telomerase actually uses an RNA template to help extend the DNA strand. So what's really fascinating is that um, when it comes to telomeres, it can actually it can actually be used to determine sort of the age of the cell. So what's really interesting about the aging is that as you get older and older, the cells sometimes actually get a little bit bad about maintaining the telomeres. So your telomeres actually kind of get shorter and shorter as you age. So in some cells, right, this continues on. So oftentimes, if you're talking about germline cells, they might continue uh, maintaining those telomeres, but eventually some of those genes may be lost. And um, what happens is over time, your body, I guess, does a, a worse and worse job of maintaining those telomeres. So the telomeres get shorter and shorter across the time and, and as you age. So there you go. DNA replication and a brief mention of telomeres. You can read this if you want. Now, when it comes to the DNA itself, obviously DNA re um, replication isn't necessarily perfect. There can be issues with that and, and mistakes, but there are mechanisms that can be used to help repair that DNA that potentially is maybe oriented incorrectly. So DNA polymerase itself actually can make mistakes. And then of course, as a result, that DNA polymerase will actually have to sometimes fix those mistakes. So 
This is also known as proofreading. So if you look at um, DNA polymerase 3, it can actually recognize if it put in a wrong base and then kick it out and then put in the right one. You also have other types of repair. For instance, uh, you have mismatch repair. So in newly, repli newly replicated, there you go, newly replicated DNA, it's actually, there's actually this scanning method using different proteins like the, the mute L and mute S and mute H proteins that can be used to basically look at mismatches. But this occurs for a relatively short period of time. It's usually looking at methylation signals. So the old strand has methyls that are attached to it, whereas the newly replicated strand does not. But um, this is trivial, I guess, to a greater or lesser degree. But even after newly replicated DNA, there can still be repair mechanisms. And then finally, you have sort of excision repairs, where you actually basically have the fully replicated DNA. So you can't really do mismatch repair anymore, maybe because it's already being methylated. And now you have to use other methods to sort of fix the issues, if there are any in the DNA strand. And excision repair does a good job of that, where you basically throw in enzymes that can scan the DNA. And with a complex series, you can actually excise maybe a specific base, um, or maybe a specific nucleotide, or maybe a specific sequence of nucleotides. And once you kick those out, you can use DNA polymerase 1 to come in and put in the correct, uh, the correct bases, kind of like how it kicks out the primers and then puts in the correct bases. You can do that with excision repair as well, where you basically have uh, an in an, a, a strand that's incorrect. You can then chip it away with certain enzymes, uh, endo and exonucleases they're called, and then you can refill those gaps with DNA and that's done by DNA polymerase 1 and then ultimately you can run it through again with DNA ligase to basically form those phosphodiester bonds. So that was actually an absolute train wreck of a ramble that took like what 22 minutes at this point. Um, so bottom thing is if you found this useful that's great if you didn't find it useful um, yeah I, I don't blame you this is going to be a very complicated and tricky topic I think the best way that you can try to kind of break this down is look at the individual enzyme components and then once you figure out those individual enzyme components go one step further and look at the uh, animations that are often available online so you can just google it and figure out which is the best animation for you. Look at it, see how everything works, and sometimes uh, actually seeing the video uh, and, and seeing visually how this process plays out in the long run may be beneficial to you in remembering and learning this material. And this definitely comes back up. So it's not just in, in intro courses, it comes back for like cellular biology and, and biochemistry courses. So make sure you get a good understanding of this and if you do already, then perfect, and that's really great for you. So that's my ramble of DNA replication. I hope you all found it mildly useful. And um, as always, I wish you the best of luck in your studying.